Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are. Thank you all for joining me today for the eighth of our Columbia CVIPS lecture series on the AC industry relating to COVID-19. I'm Fenioski Peñamora, Director of Columbia Center for Buildings, Infrastructure and Public Space, and Professor at Columbia's Fu Foundation School of Engineering and Applied Science. As, this, as the events of the last weeks have demonstrated, we are living during challenging times characterized by divides and distrust. I hope we are achieving a better understanding of social and economic justice. Along with many of our colleagues in New York City and around the world, the faculty and staff of the Center for Buildings, Infrastructure and Public Space would like to add our voice to those denouncing systemic and institutionalized racism. We all need to build a better future for our city and for our world. A world characterized by respect, opportunity and collaboration. These lectures bring people together to address the impact, response, recovery, and preparedness of the AC industry to the coronavirus pandemic. But they are also linked to the relation of social, economic, and environmental justice to the new normal in the AC community. Our first six speakers from New York, Los Angeles, and Paris all address the experience of their offices in relation to COVID-19 impact, response, recovery, and preparedness. We have heard about public buildings, civic infrastructure, and changes in office operations. Today, we return to the parallel universe of London, where design and construction are characterized by tradition, innovation, and civic civility. Subsequent talks will focus on the projects of New York's health and hospitals, the US Army Corps of Engineers, the city of Sao Paulo, and the practice of Mark McDonald. Please check our site to see more information about our next speaker and my co-moderators. I also would like to thank the organizations with whom we are collaborating in presenting these lectures. They are the American Council of Engineering Companies, New York, thanks Jay Simpson, the American Institute of Architects, New York chapter, thanks Benjamin Prosky, the American Society of Civil Engineers, thanks Tom Smith, the Consortium for Sustainable Urbanization, thanks Lance Brown, the Construction and uh, 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 Management Association of America, New York and New Jersey, thanks, Vinny Falkowski, Engineering News Records, thanks, Jan Tuckman, and the National Academy of Construction, thanks, Wayne Crew, for all your support. Today, I'm pleased that Purnima Kapoor has joined me by Sue to be co-moderator and respondent. Purnima is one of the faculty of Columbia's Graduate School Architecture, Planning and Preservation, she previously served as a executive director of the New York City Department of City Planning. Welcome, Purnima, for joining us. As an independent planning consultant, she has consulted to Harvard and the New York City Department of Design and Construction. Our speaker today is Peter Murray, curator in chief of New London Architecture, located in the heart of London at the Building Center. Peter was appointed as one of Major Sadiq Khan's mayoral design advocates to which he brings his design sensibility, environmental consciousness, and alternative transportation advocacy. He previously served as a member of Boris Johnson's Mayor's Design Advisory Group. Full bios are on the CBIPS website. Thank you, Peter, for being here with us. It's a pleasure. And uh, thank you for inviting me. Now I'm going to just start off with a, a, a little piece of music, uh, which will introduce my talk. So that was uh, Ralph McTell. It was a uh, tune about the streets of London, uh, but interesting enough, it was uh, not only, I'd say, a romantic view of the streets of London, but also a criticism of the streets of London being used uh, as uh, sleeping uh, quarters for homeless people. And I'll come to uh, that impact of uh, COVID-19 in a moment. But uh, what I wanted to talk about today was how our streets are changing in London, how they've been changing uh, for the last uh, couple of decades, what is happening right now uh, during COVID-19, but also then how I hope things will change in the future. So I'll just uh, start with a bit of explanation about New London architecture. Uh, we are an architecture and built environment centre in, in, at the heart of London. We have an exhibition space, as you can see there, 
uh, with a large model of London which shows all the new developments which are taking place there and uh, which is a really good way of introducing London's very complex uh, planning both in the method of planning but also the layout of uh, the city and I'll talk more about that in a moment. But we also have a very busy program of events and lectures and seminars and indeed uh, Zoom meetings like this uh, but also we have a membership made up of everybody from the mayor uh, through to architectural practices to engineers and to local boroughs. And uh, another confession of mine is that uh, in 2013 I cycled across America from uh, Portland, Oregon to New York and then on to London uh, in order to study what uh, US cities were doing to improve uh, conditions uh, for cycling. And uh, so we visited very interesting cities uh, like Portland, obviously, but also Minneapolis, Pittsburgh, uh, Philadelphia, and then uh, uh, New York, uh, where I was happy to meet my, 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 my heroine, really, in terms of uh, uh, the way that cities are changing, uh, Jeanette Sadiq Khan, who then, of course, was commissioner for uh, uh, the Department of Transit in New York at the time. Now, one of the things, of course, that we learned as we uh, crossed America is the benefit of having a gridded city and the benefit of wide streets and the ability to deliver uh, safe and spacious uh, cycling infrastructure in uh, American cities. Uh, this is in uh, Chicago, a photograph I took not long ago, uh, some really interesting installations there, uh, but very different to delivering cycling infrastructure in the complex layout of a city like London. And this is a plan which was delivered uh, recently by Transport for London looking at cycling infrastructure at the moment. And the purple lines are the street space routes. Street space is the uh, uh, title, a uh, marketing title that the mayor has delivered for the improvements that are being delivered during COVID-19 to improve conditions for pedestrians and for cyclists while public transport is uh, only able to be used uh, during social distances uh, to a very limited uh, degree. Now I put this uh, map up now because it does give you an idea of the uh, issues that might be created by our very centric uh, type of layout uh, we have uh, these radial routes coming into the centre. Even the cycling routes are uh, radial. Uh, we lack uh, uh, orbital connections, which we really desperately need. But it means that it actually makes it uh, more difficult to move around from London's towns, which are centred around the outside of the central core. So. The way that London is governed, uh, we are lucky to have a coordinated transport uh, system basically where the underground and buses uh, are actually uh, co coordinated through Transport for London and that is under the control of the mayor. But the problem is that as far as roads are concerned, uh, the mayor only controls about 5% of London's roads, the rest are controlled by London boroughs, so that everything that happens on uh, the borough roads has to be carried out uh, with, with cooperation between Transport for London and the local boroughs who often have local residents who resist some of the changes, certainly the changes that I would like to see uh, to happen to our streets. We've had three elected mayors of London. We only started having elected mayors in year 2000. Our first was a chap called Ken Livingston. He was a left-wing Labour mayor and he uh, delivered a number of very welcome changes. Uh, the best probably was the congestion charge, which meant that people had to pay uh, a, a, a fine for entering into the uh, central area. And that uh, over time reduced the amount of private cars going into the centre by over 30%. The problem is the uh, reduction in congestion has now been reversed by the number of uh, deliveries to uh, because of the internet and also the increase in private hire vehicles uh, with Uber and other suppliers. Uh, Ken Livingston also came up with uh, ideas for a bike hire system and cycle superhighway. But the person who, who delivered those was the next mayor who was elected in, in 2008. And this is a chap called Boris Johnson, who is now our prime minister. 
and he is also a cyclist. And uh, a cyclized city is a civilized city is a slogan that I wrote for him uh, for his first term and which he used uh, quite regularly to uh, convince people, this is something that I believe myself very much, is that actually uh, by uh, increasing uh, walking and cycling in cities, you create a more uh, civilized public space. And I think that is one of the key reasons uh, for uh, promoting uh, cycling and walking as much as the actual uh, transit it provides at the same time. So uh, Boris Johnson, he uh, delivered the uh, bike hire system, which uh, Ken Livingston had started, uh, much to Ken Livingston's annoyance. They were called Boris bikes and still are called Boris bikes and are uh, used uh, uh, quite regularly. And uh, we now have about 17,000 of them, I believe. The first infrastructure which Boris Johnson uh, put in was, uh, were painted routes like this. Un unprotected routes and there was a certain amount of criticism uh, from the cycling community that these were uh, not as safe as people would like. Uh, one of the reasons of course for promoting more protected cycle routes is uh, a lot of the resistance to more people cycling it comes from those who are afraid to uh, get out on the road so uh, protected uh, uh, routes are important and I'll, again I'll talk about that more in a moment. But in his second term, Boris Johnson uh, had a budget of a billion pounds over uh, a 10 year period to deliver new infra infrastructure for London, which was a, a welcome boost. And he had a number of policies which he pursued. Uh, this is a new cycleway uh, or cycle superhighway, as they were called then, a cycle superhighway, uh, which is intended to go uh, from East London right through to West London, 15 miles long. Uh, the longest in Europe, uh, Boris Johnson thought, uh, but uh, unfortunately it hasn't been completed. It's been built uh, in this area around the Houses of Parliament and on uh, the embankment, and this is uh, where it is on the embankment now. But there are some boroughs uh, which uh, do not like the idea of having cyclists going through them, and they have actually slowed down the delivery of uh, this, uh, I think, very welcome piece of infrastructure which has actually increased the number of cyclists in London and the number of cyclists cycling safely in London uh, very uh, considerably. So now one of the other interesting things that Boris Johnson uh, commissioned when he was mayor uh, was a uh, task force report on roads in London. Uh, this was partly to uh, get uh, cars moving more efficiently uh, but also to look at the way that we used uh, space, looking at street, uh, streets as public spaces and using them more effectively and more efficiently and as I said in a more civilized manner. And so the plan of uh, the family of streets was that uh, uh, all streets in London would be designated into different categories. And uh, here are nine uh, basic different sorts of uh, streets, which range in the top left hand corner to uh, fast movement roads, uh, where you probably wouldn't want to cycle, even if you could. Uh, down in the bottom right hand corner, uh, slow pedestrian areas, uh, which uh, might be pedestrian only, but could actually be shared spaces between uh, cyclists and uh, pedestrians. So this uh, uh, differential between uh, move, places of movement or streets of movement and uh, streets are, that are places and places for people to sit out, enjoy uh, quiet spaces, relaxing spaces. Uh, that uh, differential uh, was, uh, a, I think, a real step forward to deciding what sorts of infrastructure might actually be needed in different types of, of, of streets. This has now uh, evolved into a, a healthy streets program uh, under Sadiq Khan, which uh, again I'll talk about later. Uh, another interesting program which Boris Johnson delivered was called Mini Hollands, and it was, they were called Mini Hollands because a lot of uh, people in London looked to Holland as being the place where uh, the most civilized cycling takes place, and so if we could uh, emulate uh, what was happening in Holland, then uh, we would have a much better infrastructure. Three boroughs uh, were chosen for funding through this mini Holland program. Uh, this is Kingston, which is a borough in West London, 
uh, where they delivered new cycling infrastructure, but also the benefit of this because it was borough-wide uh, program uh, that it was actually uh, an integrated uh, network of uh, cycleways, landscaping, and uh, uh, throughways for uh, safe cycling. So then uh, things changed when uh, Sadiq Khan, uh, our latest mayor, he was elected in in uh, 2016, and he would be have been re-elected because a four years term uh, uh, this uh, last month, but uh, because of COVID-19, the uh, elections have been delayed. But he uh, instituted the idea of a walking and cycling commissioner. And the idea of walking cycling commissioner actually came out of the uh, Boris Johnson administration, having realizing that actually uh, promoting purely uh, walking uh, infrastructure uh, was not enough. And so the idea of integrating walking and cycling is now a key part of uh, Sadiq Khan's uh, program. And some of the uh, cycleways, which were originally in Boris Johnson's program, were delivered under Sadiq Khan. And this is one a north-south uh, route over the Thames, uh, which is in operation now. And this is a pretty uh, typical picture of uh, the number of cyclists using it. They have really been uh, welcomed by cyclists and are very busy at uh, Russia and uh, there are areas of London uh, where the uh, uh, amount of vehicles, if one counts uh, cycling, uh, bicycles as vehicles, uh, way outnumber uh, the cars on the streets. Now one of the key elements of uh, Sadiq Khan's uh, transport strategy is a shift, uh, um, a, a modal share shift of uh, trips uh, using walking, cycling and public transport, active transit. Uh, so at the moment we have 64% uh, of uh, trips are by uh, those three means and uh, the idea is by 2041 that will grow to 80%. Now it'll be very interesting to see whether uh, the impact of COVID-19 speeds up that process and I hope it will and that uh, again is what I think the impact of some of the uh, temporary infrastructure we're putting in place at the moment uh, will have. Sadiq Khan has also brought in a uh, low emission zone in the centre. Over the next couple of years that will be increased to uh, more outer rings but this is just the uh, central area which is the area which was also covered by the uh, congestion charge. This means that people with older vehicles have to uh, pay a fine every time they go into the area uh, and uh, that means that uh, in the first three months that this was installed, it was installed in April last year, uh, the uh, emissions reduced by about 30 percent. It was uh, highly effective, much better than people had expected and uh, so this will be rolled out uh, into a wider area in uh, the next year or so. So th this, is, this is a rather long and, uh, and a detailed list of the sorts of things that uh, Sadiq Khan is planning to uh, do as a part of improving uh, streets. I would say that uh, each of these are very positive elements in terms of uh, making streets better places to be in, like improving uh, local walking routes uh, and also encouraging more freight consolidation. Now I would say my uh, criticism of that is that encouraging more freight consolidation is not powerful enough. Freight consolidation is absolutely essential um, and I don't know if it's a, a term that you use uh, in the States but uh, here uh, it means that basically uh, instead of having multiple deliveries uh, and multiple collections from places of business, uh, you have them consolidated in out-of-town out of areas and you, instead of having uh, many vehicles, uh, you have single vehicles coming to uh, places of use. And uh, that, I think, needs a strategic uh, view and uh, it needs more than encouragement to uh, make it happen because that is really important in terms of uh, clearing our streets. 
also you will see on this it, it, the mayor wanted to transform Oxford Street. Oxford Street is our central retail street in the heart of London's West End and uh, uh, that didn't happen through disagreements uh, with the local authority. As I say the local authority and this was uh, the local authority of Westminster uh, uh, didn't want it to happen. But one of the uh, key aspects of uh, the uh, Sadiq Khan's uh, transport strategy is healthy streets, uh, again, encouraging walking and cycling, but also looking at ways of making streets that much more uh, friendly to use, uh, quieter, less polluting, easier to cross, places to sit at, places to gather, and uh, places to enjoy. So that anyone designing uh, streets now uh, should uh, take note of uh, these uh, different uh, aspects of healthier streets uh, so that you can actually score a sheet, uh, a street uh, to uh, meet these particular requirements. So it's clean air, easy to cross, places to stop, not too noisy, people feel safe. Uh, these are a part of encouraging more people to uh, walk and to cycle. Now we have been having uh, uh, over the years uh, various uh, uh, pieces of uh, uh, nice, uh, interesting improvements in terms of streetscapes. This is a, a, a area of shared space in uh, North London. Uh, quite a lot of areas where uh, we're closing off streets to stop uh, rat running through traffic and to create uh, lower traffic neighbourhoods. And uh, this is another example of that. These are, these are permanent installations which were put in before uh, the COVID-9 emergency started, uh, but we are seeing more of those again, as we'll come to later. So this is the image that appears in uh, Sadiq Khan's London plan, uh, which really illustrates uh, his uh, sort of perfect street uh, with uh, uh, restrictions of through traffic, a, uh, a place to store bicycles in the street here, uh, lots of bike parking and uh, places where young children uh, can cycle uh, safely and children can play, people can sit out and uh, low pollution levels. So uh, that is the ideal uh, he healthy street. And uh, we ha have uh, some, as I say, that have been delivered. Now this is uh, a very interesting shared space. It's called Exhibition Road, which is near our main museum quarter and this is the uh, south part of it uh, which is a short stretch uh, where it works very well with people being able to uh, share the space as you can see here people sitting out in restaurants and uh, uh, there would normally be a few cyclists and there would be cars coming slowly along this space so uh, a very civilized and uh, shareable space now uh, further north uh, the uh, street continues where it becomes longer and straighter. That doesn't work so well because it hasn't really been designed to slow the traffic down enough and uh, it doesn't, it's not uh, quite so good for sharing. And shared space I think is key to how we uh, generate uh, good places within the city. And this is a shared space which is actually remarkably uh, fairly successful. This is right in the heart of uh, the uh, central business district. Uh, this is uh, where you, you see, uh, particularly uh, when people are commuting, you see cyclists coming through here, pedestrians quite crowded, and they all uh, manage to interweave uh, uh, reasonably successfully uh, between each other uh, without clashing because each is aware of uh, the presence of the other and uh, making sure that uh, uh, they don't uh, bump into each other too much and there have been video studies of that to, that show that it uh, does actually work and, and uh, people interweave well. But that does not mean that uh, relations between all uh, members of the community are actually uh, working very well and this is an area uh, close to where I live in the west of London. This is a cycleway which was proposed uh, by Sadiq Khan and uh, it uh, raised the wrath, not just of local residents, every single amenity society along here uh, voted against it. And uh, uh, in uh, uh, this image, uh, uh, this is a headline uh, from uh, the London newspaper, and uh, the uh, top of it uh, says that the, uh, the, uh, a 
the local priest in uh, a, a church on the route uh, got his parishioners to pray to have it stopped uh, because he said it would do more damage uh, than the Luftwaffe did uh, during the uh, Blitz in the Second World War. And uh, so a lot of antagonism. However, this has been uh, pushed through and luckily as a result of the COVID emergency, it is now being, uh, uh, it is happening rather faster than uh, we feared uh, that it might. Now I'm going to look uh, briefly at the City of London. Now, just to explain, the City of London is not the whole of London. Uh, the whole of London is called the Greater London Area. Right in the centre, there is the City of London, which is the historic core. And this is also called the Square Mile, because that's about how big it is. It was a medieval city, and the city walls are still there. So because it's medieval city, uh, before they had cars, um, it was actually a walking city. And so the plan is that it will once again be returned to being a walking city through with one of the best transport strategies uh, that I'm uh, aware of of any major city in the world. And this is a, a, a painting I did as a part of a uh, program to push changes in the center of uh, uh, the city of London. This is its major junction, which has seven roads coming into it. Very dangerous, uh, a uh, young, uh, uh, Chinese banker was uh, killed here uh, four years ago now and that uh, made the city authorities wake up and uh, do something about it and to have a plan to uh, make it better for pedestrians and uh, cyclists and uh, also allow buses to use it. So uh, this is the actual space. It is uh, restricted. Uh, buses can go through but uh, no other uh, traffic apart from uh, cyclists and uh, pedestrians. So that will be the core of changes which are taking place in the city of London and within this area of the city uh, it, it's really quite remarkable in that 93 percent of people going there actually do come by active travel. They travel by public transport or they walk or they cycle and uh, this has been a policy which has been pushed recently so you're seeing that uh, since 1999, the number of motor vehicles coming into the square mile this in the heart of London um, has halved since uh, 1999. And they are also now uh, going to uh, seek approval from the Ministry of Transport to reduce all movement of cars to 15 mph. 15 mph really makes a huge difference in the relationship between uh, different road users. So th those were all longer term strategies in the way London is changing. These are now being speeded up by uh, COVID-19. And the policies that are happening at the moment are both national and local. So uh, the national policies uh, which are brought about to Im allow greater space for pedestrians because of social distancing, allow uh, more people to cycle because of the restrictions in the uh, in public transport, in buses and the underground system. So we have uh, pop-up cycle facilities, uh, widening of footways, school streets, uh, 20 mile an hour speed limits, lots of places, uh, filters create uh, low traffic neighbourhoods, cycling parking and uh, a, a series of changes uh, which are being instituted nationally which are making a huge difference to our experience of streets. One of the real interesting things of this was that when it, they started, lots of people in local authorities said, oh, how are we going to do this? We have to uh, consult everybody. We have to uh, uh, deliver it. But actually, uh, these things are permitted uh, through either being experimental or they're temporary. You can put in an experimental scheme if you monitor it. And then if it works, you keep it. If it doesn't work, uh, you take it away, similar to what happened in New York under uh, Jeanette Sadiq Khan, or it can be temporary where it is uh, just for a particular uh, length of time. So the, the, it was much easier to deliver uh, than a lot of people thought. Now the Mayor of London, he is only really able to operate strategically, strategic cycling network. He wants to see local town centres transformed to encourage cycling and walking and create better connection between cycling, walking and uh, public transport nodes and also he wants to reduce traffic on residential streets. 
but he has to uh, work closely with the boroughs if he's going to deliver that. Now, one of the benefits of uh, COVID-19 is it has actually delivered changes that, you know, this sort of thing has frustrated cyclists and uh, people who have delivered cycling infrastructures for years and suddenly you know, overnight uh, we bring in uh, regulations that actually stop cars uh, blocking cycleways. That is to be welcomed and we have delivered a lot of uh, temporary infrastructure like this to improve uh, safety for cyclists school streets where you're not able to drive your cars close to schools this has increased the number of people children walking to schools in uh, this had already been in place in one borough the borough of hackney in london and that increased the number of children walking to school by some 60 percent and now if this is replicated right across london and becomes permanent it will make a huge difference to the quality of streets so these are temporary installations where you're reducing access. Luckily, these are too heavy for uh, people, frustrated residents to move out of the way. And uh, they do actually work very effectively. Uh, they also have uh, a benefit to some of the local authorities that people get fined uh, through the cameras. And that actually brings in a substantial income, income that local authorities are losing because they haven't got quite so much parking. And this is a street just around the corner from me uh, where uh, these uh, uh, simple simple signs and uh, uh, de restriction of access is actually making a huge difference to the streets overnight and these are things which I hope very much uh, will uh, remain. Hmm. Right, I don't know what happened there. Right, I'm back. Sorry, I disappeared for a moment. Um, and this is uh, our deputy mayor, uh, uh, Heidi Alexander, her name is, and here she is opening uh, this major stretch of uh, cycle route on Park Lane, which is a central, uh, I think it goes up to eight uh, uh, lanes of uh, carriageway at certain parts. It's a huge polluting uh, freeway through the center of London. And this now has this excellent uh, cycle route uh, through the middle of it. As I said, I'm keen on shared space. And uh, every now and then I, I produce drawings like this to try and push uh, particular changes in areas. And this is in a part of the uh, city of London uh, where uh, it is no, not, no longer a through route and could easily be changed into a place where cyclists and pedestrians can actually share the space and create amenable spaces uh, for sitting out, eating, and the sort of things that actually uh, central city areas need to start doing to improve uh, the people's uh, desire to come and stay and use them, actually use the office spaces, uh, which may well be under threat in a post-COVID environment. And this is another little campaign in uh, Soho in central London. It's an area which has where almost the whole of the ground floor is given over to hospitality of bars, clubs and restaurants. And uh, that is really endangered because of COVID-19. And the aim is that uh, restaurants should be able to use the streets as they are in many other cities and in New York. But uh, sadly here, uh, again, this is something that happens so often with cycling and walking infrastructure. The local residents who live above the shop here, as it were, they are complaining. And the local Westminster Council, which is one of the most backward of councils in terms of uh, changing street use, uh, they listen to uh, the residents who are the voters rather than the businesses that operate uh, in the area. And that's very worrying because that again has the potential to actually hollow out some of the core benefits of uh, the uh, city central area. Now one of the interesting things that I came back from the States with was that uh, when we were in uh, Portland, one of the great things I noticed was actually motorists were so polite. Motorists in London are not that polite and actually uh, the idea that uh, we need to get people to collaborate and work together in order to be able to share space is really important. This is something I brought back from the States to deliver to uh, Boris Johnson. Uh, the, the door behind me is City Hall and I delivered to Boris Johnson, which uh, hopefully he, he took note of. But now I just want to talk briefly about what uh, the uh, 
future holds in terms of uh, changing uh, the way we use cities. And I start here with Barcelona because it's a gridded city and it has, it can almost in abstract give us an idea of what I think uh, cities need to do, which is the use of super grids here where through traffic is diverted to the outer ring of the uh, nine uh, smaller grids within it and the, the uh, area within the uh, circular traffic movement is low traffic areas uh, designed for uh, pedestrians and for cyclists and for uh, eating out, uh, putting uh, restaurant tables in the streets, all that sort of thing which I think makes for an amenable city. Now I was very interested to read that uh, Andy Dalgo uh, who is elected in wonderfully elected into uh, back into office in Paris uh, with uh, a very uh, good majority on a green ticket and a ticket for uh, delivering more walking and cycling in the city and so the idea of 15 minute city I think is a, is a very interesting one. I, I would just take issue with uh, their illustration here where it shows that the uh, center of the 15 minute circle is the individual. I actually think that uh, much more important is that the center of the circle is actually a, a transport hub, uh, facilities in a, a, a denser center uh, with uh, the 15 minute uh, with uh, residential in a dentritic uh, format uh, moving away from it. And that uh, forms part of uh, one of our key strategies at uh, NLA has been to promote the idea of a more polycentric city, uh, reducing the uh, dominance of, of, of the centre. And that we use this illustration which was drawn by Cedric Price looking at the way that cities are changing. The, 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 the ancient city was one uh, which had a wall around it, was confined. Uh, the uh, uh, 19th and actually I think even 20th century city uh, went uh, spread out uh, with the white of the egg spreading uh, thinly over the countryside around it and uh, uh, what we're seeing the, the modern city is becoming uh, this series of centres uh, rather than a single centre which dominates everything else. And uh, this was a drawing which was done uh, in uh, 1945 as a part of the replanning of London after the Second World War and the bombing in the Second World War and it defined uh, the social areas of London and uh, it's very interesting that you can look at uh, uh, these even today whether it says Hampstead or Dalston or Chiswick or North Lambeth these are all areas which people still identify today even though they have larger borough areas which are uh, controlling uh, what happens in in that particular uh, part of uh, of the city. And so uh, this is a, a map of the uh, Greater London area and you can see uh, this uh, dense centre, the uh, central uh, zone here, central activity zone is called, is where uh, you know, a lot of the uh, recognisable landmarks of London are located but London is also made up of all these other towns around it. They were historically uh, uh, villages and towns uh, separate from London uh, back in the uh, 15th and 16th century. Uh, they've grown over time until uh, they spread together, joined together to create the large metropolis. But uh, they haven't really in recent years had uh, the investment uh, that they need uh, to have strong uh, retail and, uh, sorry, uh, retail and uh, uh, community facilities and that's something which I think the impact of uh, COVID-19 will be to uh, I think one thing we almost all agree with there will be more home working that is likely to uh, benefit local areas it'll make uh, life a bit more difficult in the centre but I think that all those uh, authorities the mayors uh, they need to start responding to uh, this shift which is going to happen uh, because I believe that uh, the, 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 the city uh, will survive uh, COVID-19. I don't believe everyone is going to move way out to the suburbs, but I do think as far as London is concerned, in terms of the way that London is structured, uh, we need to review precisely what the uh, central activity zone is for, 
and how it will be used, but also look at ways that we can actually uh, deliver uh, the 15-minute uh, city around these existing hubs of villages and town centres, uh, which have been a key part of uh, London's history uh, for the last uh, thousand years. Now I, I end with this image because this is actually from uh, the uh, video which went with the song I started with, The Streets of London, and as I said that was a, uh, might say, an attack not just on uh, the uh, quality of streets but also on the fact that streets were uh, seen as places, uh, there were just too many homeless people in streets and uh, what uh, were we going to do about it. We have actually, as a result of COVID-19, uh, almost all the homeless people in London and around the UK actually have been moved to decent accommodation in hotels and places like that uh, over the uh, last uh, two months. And this has had a hugely beneficial effect on them and their health and their general attitude to, to life. Not a huge amount of money. And uh, one hopes that actually not only will we see changes to our streets, uh, which are improving the way we move around them, more cycling, walking, uh, uh, but also we hope we can end up with streets which are uh, more equitable and do not become dormitories for people with no homes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Thank you so much for that really illuminating discussion and um, sort of showing us the innovative and the um, cutting edge work that is going on in London. Um, you know, whenever we are hit with crises of this scale, and this is sort of unprecedented in the global history beyond sort of, you know, going back to 1918 pandemic, um, it, you know, there's instant talk of the demise of city and city life, right? We've heard the obituaries prematurely written for cities like New York and London many times, and and cities have been really resilient. We've managed to come out of most of these uh, crises generally smarter and stronger. So in my mind, there is absolutely no doubt that cities like London and New York are going to come out of this crisis perhaps stronger and smarter. The issue is, can we really re-enter the global world better than where we left it three, four, five months ago for so many of us? And, you know, to, to your points of sort of not letting a crisis go to waste, you know, we, we've all done this kind of, um, you know, crisis management in, in ways that is so beneficial to our streets, whether it is that the air is cleaner for people to, to breathe, the public space has been recaptured for pedestrians, for other uses, and, um, you know, in, in most cities, this is a big chunk of real estate. I know in New York, it's like a third of our land area is in streets. But for the last century, most of it was devoted to, uh, to cars and to auto movement. So uh, my question really is, how do you see some of these moves towards more pedestrian friendly, more bike friendly, more sort of public space friendly streets becoming more of a norm rather than something where, you know, in New York, we are talking about going back to work very soon. Some of us have gone back to work that people won't sort of start driving again and moving again um, in ways that were so much part of our habit, you know, our day-to-day -day habit. And we are talking about two cities that are very mass transit dependent as well. And, you know, I'll come to that question, but first really it is, about how do you come out of this and not lose all of the good work, all of this sort of gains in some ways that we've made in terms of public space and public streets? Well, I think one's got to realize, of course, that a lot of these benefits are being put in just because uh, uh, public transit is so uh, difficult to, or you can't get the numbers into uh, uh, train carriages at the moment. So uh, there is little alternative to delivering other ways of, of getting around. So uh, I, I always think that uh, uh, a lot of the changes that have, have actually happened in London, uh, we are a very pragmatic city, London, and I think that uh, uh, 
one of the reasons why Boris Johnson wanted to put in lots of cycleways was that it was much cheaper than building a new um, underground uh, line or even cheaper than adding uh, length of uh, platforms for an extra carriage for uh, the underground system. There's a pragmatic uh, reason for doing it. And I think we're going through a period now where uh, a lot of what is happening is a pragmatic response. It's not necessarily that everybody is uh, inspired by uh, streets maybe the same way as we are. But uh, my view is that uh, I hope that uh, we deliver changes which people will see are advantageous to their own particular area. And uh, that's why I, I, I looked at New York and I think Times Square, that was done and everyone says, you know, if that had been consulted about beforehand, it would know, have taken years arguing about it and uh, it's done, you know, one weekend, paint and pots and then when people come to say, well, what do we do about it? Actually, this is a lot better than it was before. Uh, we should keep it. And I'm hoping that, uh, and in fact, my, uh, my own area around here, I, I have um, long had battles with um, uh, uh, the car drivers of uh, my neighborhood who uh, get most excited about uh, uh, the fact that uh, new cycle routes are going to delay their journey uh, a journey which they could easily walk, uh, delay it by two to three minutes uh, or something like that. And then they start saying it's going to cause more pollution, which is uh, just uh, research shows that that does, is, is not the case. But so what I'm hoping that in this uh, uh, climate, then these changes will happen. People will see, actually, this place is much better. Even shopkeepers will realize, actually, we, we do better. And that is what research generally has shown uh, around the world, that uh, where you make these improvements, uh, retail uh, does uh, benefit and uh, that people will see them as an improvement. And so uh, one of the projects that I'm doing just in, in my local area here is actually I'm uh, commissioning uh, some uh, you know, fairly savvy uh, uh, transport engineers to do some studies which will show how we can have a shared space of the sort that I'm talking about, but will also allow slow uh, vehicles so that uh, people you know, always say, oh, well, if we can't drive, you know, I can't walk very well. How do I access it? I'm not sick enough to have a handicap sign. You, know, you can actually, I think slow traffic uh, can mix with pedestrian and cyclists uh, if you design the streets properly. And it's about slowing people down, uh, making people level of uncertainty, knowing where people are crossing. There's a whole lot of ways that this can be done and done properly. Um, I, th I think it can work very well. So I, I'm hoping that this might um, convince all my neighbours who uh, uh, just want somewhere to park their SUV uh, that actually there is a better way of doing it. That, that's really encouraging to hear. I mean, we have, you know, very similar issues here in terms of neighborhood concerns, concerns from motorists, concerns from um, people living above stores of noise. And, and, you know, some of those are legitimate concerns that can be addressed and others are just sort of, we are dug in our ways of doing things. So, um, you know, in, you know, I heard your sort of, I love the scrambled egg uh, analogy, by the way. So we, we have scrambled our egg here a little bit in the last, I would say, two decades. Um, you know, we've gone from a city that was Manhattan-centric, sort of hub and poke, everything comes through Manhattan in terms of transit, to what we are calling a five-borough development strategy. And it's been successful to some extent in some areas, and we've got a lot of work to do. However, any time we try to do that, the sort of elephant in the room really is infrastructure and transit infrastructure in particular. You know, the city has supplemented what we do through uh, subways with bikes, with uh, ferries, with um, buses, rapid transit buses. Um, but, you know, transit really is the lifeblood of the city as I see it is in, in London. So I have two sort of big concerns about when we reopen. One is mass transit is going to have to work very differently from the way it, it has been working at least here where you know we are packed like sardines at rush hour. 
And two is that there is an opportunity, I think, really for infrastructure investment coming out of this pandemic to create sort of a new economic development model as much as um, sort of addressing some of these needs. Can you speak a little bit to that and what your experience has been? Because the London did do the big cross, right, which was a huge investment, which here we have not seen. We've done three stops on one subway in the last sort of, um, and the Hudson Yards investment that, that Mayor Bloomberg did, but we've really not done much in the last hundred years here. Yes, well, we, we uh, have built what is called Crossrail 1, right. which uh, goes from about 40 miles in the, uh, uh, to the west to the east, right through the centre of London. It's uh, overground uh, in the outer areas, goes underground in the centre. That was supposed to be completed in December 2019. Uh, they've got a few issues with the uh, uh, digital signalling, which is uh, hopefully going to be sorted out by the end of next year, and then that will be uh, up, up and running, and that uh, is, uh, you know, it's going to add a lot to the capacity. One of the big issues it had was that it was throwing huge numbers of people out into, it would have thrown huge numbers of people out into the streets uh, where the sidewalks weren't actually big enough to uh, hold them. So actually the delay has been uh, quite a good thing while we actually improved the streetscape to uh, cope with all that. But uh, the in, uh, co problem we have at the moment is that there is also a plan for a Crossrail 2. Uh, 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 Crossrail 1 was east-west, Crossrail 2 is basically uh, north-south. Now, uh, we also have an issue in that uh, when Boris Johnson was elected as Prime Minister uh, before uh, Christmas, um, his uh, plan was to rebalance the UK economy, which is basically to invest more money into the north of England, which has been economically challenged for some time. Uh, and uh, uh, we are just concerned that that might mean uh, taking away investment from London. So uh, whether uh, Crossrail 2 will happen is uh, uncertain at the moment, but we, we, it has been delayed for some time. We definitely need it because at the rate of population growth that we had at least prior to COVID, um, uh, we would have filled up the benefits of Crossrail 1 by 2031. So uh, uh, we wait to see what happens to population growth in the future because we also have the additional uncertainty of us coming out of the European Union. That happens at the end of this year and uh, nobody's quite sure what the impact of that is. So uh, with COVID and uh, Brexit at the same time, uh, it's it's quite tricky to work out what the uh, scale of these uh, problems are going to be. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Peter, and thank you, Purnima. Uh, interesting questions, and I want to just uh, follow up. Um, this is from one of your uh, uh, Londoners, um, Natalia Nikolaya. Uh, she has a question in terms of how public spaces and particularly parks um, were took great importance during the lockdown in London. And the question is, how do you see um, the connection to parks uh, could be sustained and help better the areas of public spaces? And particularly if you connect it to your last statement in terms of investment. Mm -hmm. We all have been seeing discussion on how the finances for the government because of the tax revenues were reduced, um, what are going to be the priorities moving forward. Do you see that uh, the, the lockdown show the importance of not only the hard infrastructure against sewer, water, street, but also the soft infrastructure, parks, um, and other spaces that are more open. It used to be a lot of the libraries, but still libraries would be playing a major uh, important role but how do you keep the social distancing and safety of all the citizens? Yes, uh, that's a uh, well interesting question because of course, I mean, London is actually a very green city. We are something like 40% of London is green. Uh, the mayor has a strategy to increase that to over 50% by insisting that all uh, new developments have a, a urban greening factor built into them. But uh, 
there are still clearly areas of London where uh, it is more difficult for people to get to uh, open space, but generally uh, it, it's not, uh, not too bad. And certainly there were some very interesting studies which were done uh, just before and just after we came into COVID uh, by one of the London boroughs with a lot of very high density living. And uh, they wanted to see uh, what people felt uh, living in these higher density spaces. Some of them were tall buildings, but some of them were still high, uh, still dense, but lower. And you know, the access to public space was a key part of whether uh, people uh, felt happy in, the, in those spaces. And you know, we, 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 we have had the benefits of historically uh, a lot of our uh, larger parks are they were royal parks and then when the kings and queens didn't need to go hunting in them they gave them to uh, for general access so they're dotted around London uh, some further out and some right in the centre uh, but also then in the post-war era uh, the uh, Abercrombie plan as we called it which was about the rebuilding of London after the Blitz uh, Abercrombie built into his plan uh, that uh, a number of the bombed areas, particularly in those areas uh, uh, of uh, uh, where there were fewer green spaces, that they, instead of redeveloping on those areas, there would be a, a, a network of parks. And uh, quite a few of those uh, exist now. And the longer term strategy is, I say, additional greening with new development, but also connecting these all up and making them accessible. Now, uh, the sort of investment that goes into uh, delivering all that space. We wait to see how uh, the government will respond, but only today uh, Boris Johnson was uh, quoted in the newspaper of, uh, talking about Roosevelt, about New Deal, about uh, five billion pounds to be spent on uh, hospitals, road, rail, prison, schools and high streets. So uh, the government is, is definitely looking at uh, a, a, a different form of, I'd say, economic approach that we had uh, after uh, 2000, the crash of 2008-2009, when uh, the government uh, instituted a uh, spending regime of, which was very austere. Uh, now uh, we are, it uh, looks like the government is going to uh, try and spend us out of this crisis. Uh, which clearly is a positive thing for uh, the built environment industries. Thank you. I, I would like to thank both of you, uh, both uh, you, Peter, for a wonderful uh, presentation and Ponima for very insightful questions, um, a great discussion. And also I would like to thank again the collaborating organizations, ACC New York, AIA New York, ASCE, CMAA New York, New Jersey, CSU, ENR, and NAC. I also would like to thank our colleagues at Columbia who helped pull this together, including Michael Smith, Charles Cheng, and Rick Bell. I also would like to thank our past speakers and past co-moderators, Dick Anderson, President Emeritus of the New York Building Congress, Eric McFarlane from Deputy Commissioner um, uh, for Infrastructure at the New York City Department of Design and Construction, as well as um, some of um, uh, participants today, Linda Tong, Chief Architect at New York City Transit, and Kay uh, Sam Tox, uh, Chief Architect at CUNY, who have joined us today to hear your talk, Peter, and to hear your conversation for NEMA. Uh, also, I would like to thank all of you out there in the offices, agencies, and at home throughout New York City and around the world for taking some time to listen to our lecture today. Uh, an AIA continuing education credit has been approved for this lecture. If you're an architect seeking credit, the Eventbrite registration allows for indicating your AIA membership number. If you did not submit that information at registration, please send your name and membership number to us at cbips at columbia.edu. Next Tuesday, July 7, also from noon to one, um, we will have uh, the ninth lecture of the series. Our guest speaker will be Christine Flaherty, Senior Vice President of New York Health and Hospital. She will be talking about the work that Health and Hospital did during the crisis to set up temporary hospital and health centers to address the surge on patients uh, with COVID. 
And the guest mod co-moderator will be Vincent Vini Polkowski, president of CMAA New York, New Jersey. And in my presence uh, in, uh, will be Rick Bell, the uh, associate uh, deputy uh, uh, director of CBIPS, who will be another co-moderator. On July 14, the speaker will be Lloyd Caldwell, director of military programs at the US Army Corps of Engineers, and George Olia, a chief of the military engineering branch at the US Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, my guest at that time will be Wayne Crew, General Secretary of the National Academy of Construction. So I just want to thank you, all of you, for being here. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Purnima, for being with us. And thank you, all of you. And have a wonderful evening, afternoon to everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.